Amen. Uh, let's do like we did last week. Let's take 15 seconds and let's just ask God to really speak to our hearts and take us to new levels in our walk with Him and to challenge our faith and to just really speak to our spirits this morning. So let's do that right now. Father, just thank you for everything you're going to do today. We give you all praise and glory in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. How many of you are praying and how many are you looking at your watch? Huh? Yeah, yeah some people are probably like, one, two. Um, so we've been, talking about, we've been talking about prayer. And, you know, I just want to review real quick. Last week we talked about the phenomenal start of the um, United States Navy back in the War of Independence, General George Washington funding that first schooner himself out of his own pocketbook. It was called the Hannah. Then he commissioned six other small schooners and had them fly this flag on their masts, which was basically the flag of the first United States Navy, which is the pine tree on a white field, and it says an appeal to heaven because they were bypassing uh, the courts of London where they were getting nowhere. They were bypassing the king, and they were saying, we're taking our appeal directly to God. And through that prayer... We saw where these seven little schooners took 55 British warships into captivity. Just phenomenal because that's what prayer does. And so I said that what we want to do is just demystify this whole thing called prayer so that we understand that prayer is nothing more than talking with God. Now, it's okay to talk to God in our culture, we call that prayer. But when God talks back, it's called schizophrenia for some reason, right? But God does talk back, and we hear him because conversation is a two-way street. And so we're demystifying it, and we're saying that prayer is just simply talking, and talking is basically walking with God. That's what it means to walk with God. And we started with this text in James 4, verse 8, where this is such a profound promise where God says, you know what, if you draw near to me, I will draw near to you. That's what Beth was doing. Beth was like, you know what, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, and I'm going to start drawing near to God because there's healing in his name. And all of a sudden, God began to show up and manifest and move in her life. And so this is such a powerful promise that the writer of Hebrews um, said this about it. He says, therefore, let us draw near. In other words, if God is saying, draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. The writer of Hebrews is saying, hey, therefore, newsflash, I got a clue, let's draw near to God with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. And what I want to look at this morning is that word confidence. That word confidence. Um, you know, it can be boldness, I think some translations say. But that word is a, is a compound word with confidence. In the Greek, is a compound word. It's metaparsia. And meta means with or among or in companionship with. And parsia means unwavering fearlessness or unhesitating confidence. That's what it means when he says come near with confidence, the Greek word parsia. Listen to that again. It means unwavering fearlessness and unhesitating confidence. God is saying, this is how I want you to draw near to me. Just, just with confidence and fearlessness and unhesitating. Years ago, I was reading Reader's Digest, and um, there was one of these dramas and real life stories in there. And it was about a woman who lived, I think, in Montana or you know, out, out west somewhere. And um, she was in her home. She was in her kitchen, which is at one end of the home. Her baby was in the high chair on one side of the table. She was on the other side of the table getting ready to chop up some vegetables. The window was open, and all of a sudden, a mountain lion jumped through the window and landed right on the table and turned and looked at her baby. And all of a sudden, the mama bear inside of mama just sort of rose right up, and without even thinking, she had unwavering fearlessness. She had unhesitating confidence. She grabbed a chicken, a, 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 a table knife, a, a kitchen knife, and she attacked that bear before it even had, I mean, that the lion, before it even had time to move, before it even had time to pounce on the baby, she just locked horns with it and went to town. And I mean, they just had a knockdown, scratch out fight. And when everything was said and done, that giant cat was dead on her floor. 
Because she was like, you know, that lion was looking at her baby and she was like, no, that is not going to happen. And she took action because she was fearless in that situation, unwavering fearlessness and unhesitating confidence. But you know what? The devil jumps into our lives as well. The devil jumps into our lives and says, you know what? You're never going to get free of that addiction. You're never going to get free of drugs. The devil will say you're never going to get free of the partying lifestyle. You're never going to get free of your drinking habits. You're never going to get free of your swearing that's out of control. You're never going to get free of your gossip, your pride. And we have to get angry about that, and we have to say no. And we have to have that unwavering unhe- fearlessness, unhesitating confidence to draw near to God because our help comes from the Lord. It doesn't come from a 12-step program. It doesn't come from being educated better. It doesn't come from, you know, a better job. It comes from the Lord. My help comes from God. And we have to do the same thing that that lady did. We have to say, no, this isn't going to happen, and put our foot down and take the action of faith. You know, we talk about faith. Faith is an action. This is what James says. James says the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Now, we know that righteousness is not by our own standards or our own goodness. You're not righteous because you're good. You're righteous because you have faith in Jesus Christ. His goodness is what pleases God. His goodness is what is imparted to you. And so you and I this morning are righteous. And James says that the effective, I think the King James says, the fervent prayer of a righteous person accomplishes things. You don't pray, things don't happen. You pray, things happen. And I want you to look at that word effective, or in your version it might say fervent. And that word in the Greek is the word energio. Does it sound like anything we know? Energy, right? We have power this morning, electricity, because of nuclear energy taking place in Seabrook, basically controlled explosive energy. We have heat this morning because there's explosive energy taking place in a furnace where oil is being combusted. You got here today because you started a car and there were controlled explosions of energy inside that engine that helped you get here. Energy is motion. And he's saying here that the effect of the energy of the energetic prayer, but you know what else it means? It also means stretched out stretched out. It's somebody that's reaching to God, the effect of the stretched out prayer. God, I am going to lay hold of you. I am going to touch you. Now, you know what that's like. You know, you watch this horror movie and there's this monster, you know, laser beam shooting at this guy. The hero's running and a monster's shooting. All of a sudden, there's a big explosion. The guy's laying on the ground. He's got a big eye beam across his legs and he looks and here comes the monster and then he looks and his gun's over there, right? It's always like two inches away from his reach. And what's the guy do? He's like, and the music's like, dun, 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 dun. And he's reaching, around. and I don't know how he grows two inches, but it always manages to get, you know, his little fingernail on the edge of the gun. And he drags it in, and he turns it, bop, 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 and he shoots a monster. And everybody's happy. It's a great ending. But that's what it means. It means stretched out. It means you're in a panic. You're desperate. You're reaching out to God with all that you can have. See, faith lays hold of something. Leonard Ravenhill said this. He said, God doesn't answer prayer. God answers desperate prayer. When we're desperate and when we're reaching out, when we're angry, when we've said, I've had enough. And that's when we become unwaveringly fearless and we become unhesitatingly confident. And this is what's happening, reaching out to the promises of God, laying hold of the promises of God. You see, faith has got to be anchored in something. Prayer has got to be anchored in something. And what it's anchored in is in the promises of God. Look at this verse in 1 Corinthians, it says, or 2 Corinthians first, uh, chapter 1, verse 20 says, For as many as the promises of God, in him they are yes, therefore also through him is our amen to the glory of God through us. And you read that, you know, when you just read that, for as many as the promises of God, in him they are yes, therefore through him is our amen to the glory of God. And you're like, what, what in the world is that even saying? You know what I mean? Like sometimes you read the Bible and it might as well still be written in Greek, right? I mean, it's like, you know, it is written in Greek, but, you know, we, we read the and we're like, what is it? But just unpack this for a moment, okay? First, look what he's saying. He's saying, for as many as the promises of God, okay, well, how many promises of God are there? Well, I want you to know something. There's tons. 
There's tons of promises. This is God's living word to you. These aren't historical letters written to, you know, uh, Mo, Larry, and Curly a bunch of years ago. This is stuff written to you today. God's living word is living, powerful, active, sharper than any two-edged sword. And so this is from God's heart to your heart. And when you read this book and you see something and you say, gee, that might be a promise to me. That could be something that I could stand on. That's exactly what it is. So throughout the entire Bible, there are tons and tons of promises that addresses every need for the human condition. That's why this book transcends cultures, ethnicity, uh, geography, timelines, everything. It's always relevant to who picks it up and reads it in faith because it's God talking to the human heart. So he says, for as many as the promises of God, well, how many are there? There's tons. He says, in Christ, they are all yes to you. You find it, you can claim it. You find a promise that speaks to your heart, you can stand on it. You can bank on it. He says, therefore, through him is also our amen. Now, amen doesn't mean I'm done praying. Like, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this church. Bless everyone here today. I'm done praying. Amen. That's not what amen means. Amen literally means, so be it. So look what he's saying. For as many as the promises of God, and there's tons of them in Christ, every one of them towards you is yes. Not no, not maybe, not I don't know. They're all yes. Therefore, through him is our let it be. So be it. Let it happen, God. I'm standing here. I'm going to stretch out to you. I'm going to claim that I'm going to be unwaveringly fearless. I'm going to be unhesitatingly confident as I draw near to you and as I approach you on these scriptures. I am believing that they are for me. And he says, that's all for the glory of God through us. God is most glorified in us when we are most content in him. When we realize that he's our source and that he's the one that's meeting all of our needs. So, so prayer has to be anchored. It has to be anchored in the scriptures. Why are you praying? What is the foundation you're praying? God wants to hear his word prayed back to him because that's how you know you're praying according to his will. God's will is his word. His word is his will. And when you pray scriptures back to God, you are praying the perfect will of God back to him. What did he say? He says, I watch over my word to perform it. He says, I sent my word and it will not return unto me void. It will accomplish that which I sent it to do. And so this is powerful stuff. He sends a word that says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And then one day, you were as blind as a bat in the dark, and you were just like going around, and, and all of a sudden, God tapped you on the shoulders, you saw the truth, and you said, Jesus, save me, and there wasn't enough power in earth or in hell to stop that word from effectively working in your heart, and you got born again. That's how it worked. You stood on a scripture. Every one of us today are saved because somewhere along the line, we believed something about the word of God. We believed something about the person of Jesus Christ. And we put our confidence in him. And we unwaveringly fearless and unhesitatingly with confidence came to him. And that's all we're standing on this morning. You've got nothing in writing other than the word of God. You don't have a certificate or a deed that says you will go to heaven. You've got nothing. Matter of fact, there's a lot of people, the entire Catholic Church says, well, you don't know, really. That's what they teach you. They don't teach you that you can have absolute confidence. Like, well, you, you really don't know until you get there. Listen, that's too late. I don't want to know when I get there. I want to know now. You know, if somebody says, hey, let's go to the Tuckaway and get a great big bacon cheeseburger, I don't want to go there and find them say, oh, we're all out of that. No, 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 no. I want to know before I go. And that's the same thing with I want to know before I go. And we believe in the promise of God. And that promise becomes like the anchor of our soul. And so he says, all of these promises in Christ are yes. Now listen, you know the story of Jacob, right? Uh, Abraham, all the promises given to Abraham, great nation, multiply him, blah, blah, blah. Abraham has Isaac. Isaac has two sons, Esau and Jacob. Esau is the oldest. So one of them is going to be the patriarch of which this whole thing continues to flow through. Well, Jacob lies and manipulates Esau into giving him his birthright because he was the oldest and the birthright should have been his. And Esau ends up giving Jacob the birthright, then later really regrets it, get angry. So, so Jacob 
heads for the high ground. He takes off. He goes to another country. He goes to his uncle Laban's house. He's hiding out. He's, 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 he's laying low. And, and then he sees that, you know, Laban has a couple of daughters, and he falls in love with Rachel, and he works seven years for Rachel, but he gives them Leah, and he's like, what's this? And then he has to work another seven years for Rachel, and then finally he's got Rachel and Leah, and they all start having kids, and, and all these, so all of a sudden they got little 12, 12 little boys running around. These 12 boys are the future tribes of Israel. This is the nation in diapers. And then he gets really blessed, and after a number of years, he says, I need to go home. I need to go back to my country, but Esau's there, and I don't think it's going to go well when Esau sees me. As a matter of fact, he's a hunter. He's rough. He's tough. You know, so Esau's like the hunter. He's rough. Jacob's like the guy with the poodles. And, and so, <laughs> so, so, he, so, so what he does is he, gets, he starts traveling back home and he gets as far as this river and he sends everybody across the river. In other words, just keep on going. But he stays on this side of the river and he says, man, I got to pray. I got to bring this to God. I got, I got to start talking to God about my future and what's going on. And so he starts talking to God and all of a sudden, God appears. Now, the Bible calls this person an angel, but we know that it's actually a Christophany. It's a pre-appearance of Jesus Christ. And they start wrestling. Now, I don't know how this stuff happens. The Bible is like an incredible book. You, you ought to read it. And so look what it says. It says, Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. I wonder if they were doing that, you know, crazy stuff like lying down on the, you know, just chairs across that. And he says, when he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he touched the socket of his thigh. So the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated when he wrestled with him. And then it goes on and it says, then he said to him, let me go for the dawn is breaking. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Now listen, God of all, God's already blessed Jacob. He blessed him financially. He blessed him agriculturally. He blessed him in marriage. He blessed him with kids. This guy's totally blessed. He's had visions. He's got a great walk with God. And all of a sudden, you know, he's there praying. He's praying, and he turns around, and there's this heavenly being. You know, the Bible says most people fall on their face. Jacob doesn't fall on his face. He unwaveringly and fearlessly and unhesitating with confidence just grabs hold of the guy. And they start wrestling and he's like got a bear grip. I'm not going to go. And he's like, let me go, dude. What's wrong with you? And he's like, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. I'm not going to bless you. He's kicking his shy thighs. I'm not going to And they're wrestling back and forth and the dust is kicked up and he's like, you're going to bless me. You're going to bless me. Because he understood that everything he needed was in this person that he had just laid hold of. I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me. This is confidence. This is faith. He sunk his teeth in. I like what Winston Churchill said about the bulldog. He said the bulldog is the God's design of dog because it can bite into you and its nose slants backwards so it can still breathe and never let go. And that's what he did like a bulldog. He just grabbed hold of this the Jesus and he's wrestling and he's like, let me go. And then all of a sudden it says that Jesus just tased him like, and, all, and his hip goes out of joint. And so he's like, you know, walking like this now. And, 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 and he lets him go. And God says, you are no longer Jacob, but I now call you Israel, a prince with God. And this is where the name of the nation comes from, this nation that all eyes are on in the Middle East, this nation of Israel, still here 3,000 years later, still on the planet, the same descendants of the same guy, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the Bible says that when Jacob was old, he worshiped God leaning on his staff. His hip had gone out after that wrestling match. It had never changed. You see, this is what happens. You hammer things out on the anvil of prayer with God, and you don't stop until you get what it is you're after. You don't give in. You don't give up. And eventually what's going to happen is God's going to touch your life, and he's going to change your walk. He's going to change the way you walk in this world because you're more important to God than you think what it is you need from him is to you. 
It'll change your walk because only changed people can change the world. You can't give what you don't have. It's just that simple. You look at Simon. Simon was a shaken reed. But inside Simon was this other character of the great disciple Peter. And it wasn't until the Holy Spirit came on him that the nature of Peter came out of him. And he was like unwaveringly confident. He was unhesitatingly fearless. Filled with the power of God. A changed life. And this is what God wants from every single one of us. And you say, man, why, you know, why was he wrestling with God? He had all these children that are the promise of God moving forward. One little kid's in Sunday school, and he says to the Sunday school teacher, he says, I read in the Bible that the children of Israel came out of Egypt. He says, that's right. I read in the Bible that the children of Israel received the law. That's right. I read in the Bible that the children of Israel built a temple. That's right. I read in the Bible that the children of Israel took the promised land. He goes, that's right. He goes, didn't the adults ever do anything? <laughs> you say, why wrestle? Why was he wrestling? This is why he was wrestling. In Mark chapter 6, it says, when it was evening, the boat was in the middle of the sea with the disciples in it. He, Jesus, was alone on the land, seeing them straining at the oars, for the wind was against them. At about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. And look at that last part. And he intended to pass them by. He was just going to walk right by. Imagine you're in a boat. And you're straining at the oars. I've been on Lake Pataquaway in my canoe on a windy day. It ain't fun. You know what I'm saying? The wind just, you know, it doesn't matter what you're trying to paddle. The wind's just blowing you around. And the wind is blowing these guys around, and they're straining at the oars. And all of a sudden, here comes Jesus. You know, and they're like, and he was just going to walk right by them. Listen, God doesn't owe you anything. God did everything he's ever going to do for you 2,000 years ago on that cross. It's up to you to lay hold of these promises. It's up to you to say, hey, and this is what they did too. They screamed out. They cried out. They got hold of Jesus until he got in the boat with them because he would have just walked right by them. This is what Jesus said. This is a funny scripture. In the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violent, and violent men take it by force. Wow, violent men who are unwaveringly fearless and who are uh, unhesitatingly confident. Violent men are taking the kingdom by force. Because you see, John the Baptist is the, the hinge, the swing between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And now that we're in the New Testament with John the Baptist, since that day, Jesus said people understand faith and they are taking the things of the kingdom of God by force. God, you are going to move in my life. You are going to bless me. I humble myself before you, but I am laying hold of the promises of God, and I'm standing on those promises of God, and you are going to move in my life. Not just easy peasy. This is what, this is what Paul said about it in 1 Timothy 6. He said, fight the good fight of faith. He didn't say dance the good dance of faith. He didn't say walk the nice walk of faith, sing the nice song of faith. He said fight the fight of faith. This is a fight, man. If you want things, you've got to get like Beth where you put your foot down and say, hey, this, I've had enough of this. I am seeking the, uh, the God of heaven and I am demanding that things happen in my life. Look what he says. He goes, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life, which you were called, and you made a good confession in the presence of many witnesses. That means you're not ashamed to tell people, hey, you know what, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I'd rather follow Jesus and be mocked by the world than follow the world and be disavowed by Jesus. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of God, for it is the power of God unto salvation. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, it is the power of God. Fight. You see, this morning you are an ordained fighter. If you have Jesus in your heart, you're ordained to fight. You're a fighter. God's called you to fight for the things of the kingdom, for anything and everything that you need. There's a story in the scriptures, Matthew chapter 9, and it says, 
a woman who had been suffering from a hemorrhage for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. For she was saying to herself, if I only touch his garment, I will be well. What an incredible story. This woman comes up behind Jesus, and she's like, you know, there's a crowd there, and and she's like, "Mm, he's got what I need. And if I can just touch him, if I can stretch out and just lay my hands on him, if I can wrestle with him, if I can by violence grab hold of him, I know I'll get what I want. And she was saying this to herself. She was saying, she was saying, because faith comes out of the mouth. What's in the heart comes out of the mouth. And faith comes out, or fear comes out of the mouth. Well, you never know. You know, lippy the lion and hearty har har. Well, you never know. But she was filled with faith. And I want you to think about some things. First of all, she had an issue of blood which made her unclean. She was going to touch a rabbi. That would have meant the death penalty. They had the right to stone her, and there was a Jewish official in the crowd because Jesus was on his way to the Jewish official's house to heal his son. The guy who would have given her the death sentence was right there in the crowd. They could have stoned her just like that. And she said, I don't care. I'm not going to live like this. It's been 12 years, and I've had it. And she comes up behind him and touches. You see, this is what we want Jesus to do. We want Jesus, Jesus, would you please just come to me and wipe my fevered brow? She come up behind him. You can't come up behind somebody unless you're following them. And that's what Jesus said. Jesus calls us, follow me. Not the other way around. Not Jesus, you stick with me, you follow me, you bless what I'm doing. That's not what it's all about. Jesus said, you follow me. And she comes up behind him and she takes. This is aggressive behavior because there are promises involved. She recognized him as the son of David with healing in his wings. That's an Old Testament scripture. And she was like, he's going to touch me. He's going to heal me. And I'm going to be violent about this. I'm going to be confident. There's a story in the scriptures where Jesus is in uh, this building and he's healing people and he's teaching. And these guys got a friend who's a paralytic. And they bring him to Jesus and no room, crowds, people inside, packed house, people outside, can't even get near the windows. And they said, well, I guess it's just not God's will that he get healed, so let's just go home. They didn't. They got violent. They got aggressive. They said, hey, let's get up on the roof. Let's tear a hole in the roof and send them down through the roof. And they did, and the Bible says Jesus, seeing their faith, Heal the guy. Now, I don't know about you, but if something like that happened, like right now, if all of a sudden a chainsaw starts buzzing, and all of a sudden you see this you know, chainsaw come through the ceiling, I'm not thinking healing, I'm thinking lawsuit. You know, you know? I mean, really, hey, that's my roof, dude. You're going to definitely pay for that. But Jesus sees their faith, and Jesus heals this guy. This is aggressive prayer. We're talking about prayer. We're talking about an appeal to heaven. But I want you to know that sometimes it's got to be desperate. It's got to be violent. It's got to be unwaveringly fearless. It's got to be with confidence that you come before God and aggressively seek Him and dare to declare and claim the promises of God. Listen, this is what The writer of Hebrews said, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith is the assurance of things that we're hoping for. It's the conviction of something I don't see. See, I know heaven's mine. I've never seen it. I know it's mine. I know salvation is mine. I don't deserve it. Nothing I've ever done deserves it. But I know it's mine. This is what faith, faith, faith is evidence. Faith is a supernatural empowerment. Faith is unstoppable in the realm of the spirit. I remember years ago when I was in Portsmouth, got a call from a lady. Can you come and pray for my daughter? There's something really wrong with my daughter. I didn't know that the old Victorian home that they lived in for years and years and years in, in old Portsmouth, you know, years, years ago, was an insane asylum. It was an insane asylum. It's where people who were out of their mind, probably some demon-possessed, and they lived there and they died there. So there was junk there, tenants there. And now, now, it's, you know, it, now it's just a residence and it's bought and sold, and this gal is living there with her eight-year-old daughter. 
And she says, can you come and pray for my daughter? And I'm like, sure, sure, sure. So I go over there. I say, what's the problem? Well, my daughter's going into trances. My daughter's hearing voices. The voices are telling her to kill me and kill my husband. The other night I woke up and she's sitting in the living room and she's got a circle of candles all the way around her and she's just sitting there mumbling. I don't think that's normal. (laughs) And I'm like, yeah, I kind of agree with you there. I don't think that's too normal either. And so started talking to her, talked to a little girl, sweet as pie, great big blue sparkling eyes, just, you know, nice little girl, seemed, seemed so wonderful and so cute. And uh, so, you know, so she says, I'm going to go to my bedroom, mommy. And I, so I was talking to the, the, the mom again, like getting some more information. And all of a sudden we hear the little girl say, mommy, my room's cold. And I look at the mother and horror comes on her face and she goes, oh my God, it's starting right now. And I go running in the bedroom, the little girl's laying on her bed, eyes wide open, staring at the ceiling. And I'm like, little faker. You know, kids, kids, aren't they something? I was never like that, but most kids are just little stinkers. <laughs> and so I got mad. I'm like, oh man, you are not going to manipulate me. You are not going to fake me out. So I roundhoused her. And I mean, I'm talking, you know, six foot four, I roundhoused her, came and I stopped that far off of her nose. Like, <laughs> and she didn't blink. She just kept staring at the ceiling. She, I mean, my fist was right there, and she didn't even blink. And then I really got mad because I realized she wasn't faking and that this was spiritual stuff and that anger, that violence, that grabbing hold of the things of God that he says, I give you power over the works of the enemy. I give you power in my name. You will cast out spirits. And I said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, you will come out of her and not leave her and and leave her. And her eyes blinked a couple times and she looked at me and started crying. Now, I don't know if that was because she was free or because she looked at me and that was even scarier. I don't know. But she started crying and I'm just kidding. She was instantaneously delivered. Because God gives us ability. God gives us power. He says, lay hands on the sick and they will recover. In my name, cast out devils and they will leave. Oh, but pastor, we're in the 21st century America. I don't think that there's devils like there might have been in the bush of Africa or, you know, on the great plains of Australia. Oh, you kidding me? Yeah. Yeah. Faith is powerful in the realm of the Spirit. Man, it reaches in. Faith substantiates the promises of God. That means it takes something intangible and makes it real. Your ears substantiate sound waves. Because right now there's just waves going through here, and the follicles of your ear substantiates that, sends a signal to your brain, and you actually hear audible words that you can understand and we can communicate. Your eyes substantiates light. See, that's really what we see. We see light reflecting off of everything. And your eyes substantiate light, and you see images, you see things. And faith substantiates that which is unseen. It grabs hold of the promises of God, and it makes them real. This isn't, you know, religious Sunday go-to-church stuff. This is a weapon Ephesians 6 says faith is the shield, the shield of faith that quenches the fiery darts of the enemy. A week ago Friday, we had our uh, Rotary Leadership Seminar in here. Fantastic. So, oh my, you, you need to make plans to be there next year. This is an incredible seminar. One of the speakers was Amanda Graponi, fourth generational owner of Graponi Car Sales in Concord. And she's talking, and she is a live wire, man. I mean, she's just a ball of energy. And she's talking about how she absolutely transformed that place, redid the sales department, uh, got away from negotiated car sales. It's a, it's, a, it's a price. It's a valued price. And just revamped the whole industry, going great guns. And then she's talking, and she's going on, and she's talking. And then she says, I can't allow negativity in my mind. Negativity is the enemy. And I thought, ooh, who uses that kind of language? That's Christianese. And I said, I wonder. And then I had to go downstairs because lunch was coming in. I had to help him bring lunch in. And later on, Darlene told me, yeah, at the end of her talk, she just said, I owe everything to my faith in Jesus Christ. And I was like, bam, there it is. You see, she understood spiritual things. She understood that negativity is an enemy. And she understood that her faith in God rises her above that. Her claiming the promises of God causes her to be successful in life because God told Joshua what? He says, meditate in my word day and night, and then you will have success wherever you go. You see, when I was bound by drugs, I didn't need a motivational talk. 
I didn't need education. I didn't even need somebody to pat me on the shoulder and give me uh, encouragement. I needed deliverance. I needed somebody to pray over me and break the temptation and break the hooks that that stuff had in my life. And it's the same with us. Sometimes we just need more. We need prayer, an appeal to heaven. My help's not going to come from a doctor. My help's not going to come from a psychiatrist. My help's not going to come from a good motivational talk. I need to appeal to heaven. My help's going to come from God. God and God alone is the only one that can deliver me. And he did. And he will because he is a good God. But sometimes you just got to get angry in order to become violent. Because the devil is robbing you out of a walk with God that you deserve, that you can enjoy, that is life-changing. Just like your hip going out of your socket changes the way you walk. God wants to change your life, and the devil robs you of these things. You need to become angry. You need to say, like that woman with the mountain lion, you need to say, no, you are not going to take that baby from me. You're not going to do it. And you put your foot down. Violent faith curses fig trees. Violent faith tells mountains to be removed and thrown into the sea. Violent faith is what Caleb had at 80 years old when they enter the promised land. And they're all taking chunks of land and Caleb's like, you know, what's happening? They're like, well, there's a mountain left over there. But man, that thing's filled with giants. And at 80 years of age, Caleb said, I don't care. Give me that mountain. I'll take it just like I did 40 years ago. Because God is the one that's doing this. And he had that violent faith. And he pressed in. And I'll tell you why. Because, man, there's resistance everywhere you turn. This is hostile, this is hostile land. We talked about that in the past. That this is the, the devil's playground. It's a battlefield. Look at what Paul says. He says, A wide door of effective service has been opened to me. And there are many adversaries. In other words, in the infamous words of George Harrison, it don't come easy. Right? I mean, there's a battle on every side. you got to fight for the things of God. You want a better walk with God? you got to fight for it. You want to draw near to God? You think the devil is just going to say, you know, that's a great idea. Hey, I, let me help you on that. I think I can help you on that. You know, that's, let's go. We can do it. No, no, no. He's not going to do that. He's going to say, dude, it's 11 below zero this morning. What are you thinking? You're going to get out of your bed? Are you going to go to church? <coughs> He's always doing that stuff. The devil's always an adversary. God is saying, hey, I've got a great life for you. I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. I've got great things for you. And the devil's like, uh-uh, no, 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 ain't going to happen. No, you're, you're in my turf. That ain't going to happen in my house. And you've got to fight for it. You've got to become unwaveringly fearless and unhesitatingly confident in the things of God. And you've got to push in and push in. The devil stops those open doors, man. And let me tell you something. Those things that you never confront, you will never conquer. It's just that simple. It's just that simple. I believe violent prayer, violent prayer, an appeal to heaven, when you're outgunned and outmatched and outnumbered, and yet you believe that God is bigger still, and you go into a violent prayer, I believe violent prayer makes you people-loving. You see, violent people are just weirdos. But people who are violent in prayer, violent in the realm of the Spirit, it makes you loving towards people. And that's what causes us to talk to people about this great God in which we serve. I go to the dentist last Wednesday, you know, get my teeth clean and everything, and, 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 and it's a new gal, like, you know, mid-20s, uh, and, and she introduces herself, and, you know, so we, of course, we start that small talk, and, you know, she's asking me questions while, uh, uh, you know, and so it's hard to talk. Of course, I don't talk that well anyway, but she, so she's asking me questions. So finally, I just say, where do you go to church? That's a great question. Man, that's just kind of like zip, laser beam right to the topic that I want to talk about. I don't care about your dog. don't care about your apartment. don't care. Where do you go to church? 
You know, my roommate and I were just talking about that Sunday. We thought, why are we sitting around in our house on Sunday? And I said, I already found out that she lived in Portsmouth. My roommate and I were just talking about that the other day. Why are we sitting around on Sunday mornings? We should go to church. And I said, well, let me tell you of a great church called Connect Community Church right there in Portsmouth. It's Assemblies of God Church. Great pastor. You will love it there. You've got to go check it out. And she goes, I will. I am going to check it out. You see, because I, listen, listen. This world is going to hell in a handbasket, isn't it? You look at the news and it's so depressing. I just saw something on news the other day now that some Saudi Arabia states are threatening to send ground troops into Syria and Syria is saying, uh, and Russia is saying that will start world war because Russia's in Syria. And, and, and it's like, you know, we live on this knife's edge of life like we know it dramatically changing just like that. But I want to look at good things. I want to look at the fact that people are redeemable. That's why Jesus came to the cross. I want to look at the fact that there's a message that I can share that some might reject, but others might receive. And I want to just believe that people want to receive the message. I just want to believe that right now in America, hearts are pliable enough that people want to hear about God and the good things about God. I'm so sick and tired of Hollywood's depiction of Christianity. You know what I mean? If there's someone messed up, it's the believer. If there's somebody that's a psycho, it's the believer. Now, I remember watching a Western years ago. There's this Western, John, John Wayne. You know what I mean? you got to get that John Wayne walk. You know, John Wayne. And man, there's like a thousand Indians coming at them. And they're behind their falling down trees with their Winchester rifles and everything. And, and, and the, the pastor, the preacher, prays a little prayer. God bless us for which we are about to receive. You know, like, what a stinking idiot. That's Hollywood's depiction of you and me. I'll tell you what, that's not God's depiction. God sees you as a fighter, an ordained fighter. God sees you as a lion. Do you know lions don't fear anything? Lions just lay down and sleep. They hear a noise, they just turn and look like, who, you? Jesus is the tr- lion of the tribe of Judah. And the Bible says he's not afraid to call you his brother. If you're the brother to the lion, you're a lion too. You just need to wake up that lion heart that's inside of you and take the things violently that God has. You know, there's a commercial you see it on TV all the time. What's in your wallet? And that's because your wallet is where you keep all your valuables, isn't it? It's where you keep your driver's license, where you keep your credit cards. It's where you keep money if you have any. You know, you, so what's in your wallet? The Bible talked about David going out to meet Goliath. Here he is, maybe a 15-year-old kid. Now, he's good with a sling. The, these weren't the little rubber band things. You know, these were... I made one once. You can take branches off trees with these kinds of slings. These are powerful weapons. And David, the Bible says, goes to a stream, and he bends down in the stream, and he looks, and he gets five smooth stones, and he puts them into his bag. And then he goes out to meet Goliath. And I don't believe he did that because he thought he might miss four times. I believe he did that because the Bible said Goliath had four other brothers. And he was so confident that he was like, if need be, I'll just drop the whole family tree right here and now. You see, you don't know when you're going to face a Goliath in your life. You don't know when you'll get bad news. You don't know when you'll get a pink slip. You don't know when you might lose someone close to you. You don't know when that Goliath is going to come in your face. And you can only take out of your bag what you've already put in your bag. So what are you putting in your bed. What's in your wallet? What are you putting in your heart? Because it's only the things that you're putting in your heart that you will be able to draw from when you face the Goliaths in your life. And what you're putting in your heart is determining whether you're going to be unwaveringly fearless in that time, whether you're going to be unhesitatingly confident in that time, or whether you're just going to back down and say, well, I don't know. An appeal to heaven talking with God, walking with God, but then having a violent faith when it comes to the promises of God. Let's pray. 
Father, I pray this morning that there's somebody here that so needed this message, that they needed to be stirred again, that the, the, the embers of their heart needed to be blown upon to come back into a flame, that God is good all the time, and all the time God is good, and that he is able to do above and beyond what all we could ask or think. And Lord, I pray for those that right now are just starting to, like, yeah, they're just starting to psych themselves out. They're just starting to say, yeah, yeah, something is rising up in their heart. That nature of Peter the rock is rising up inside of their heart saying, I will be unhesitatingly confident and unwaveringly fearless. And I will be a person of violent prayer. And I will love people. And I will believe that God's got good things in store for people because Jesus came to give life and life more abundantly. God, stir this inside of us. Stir it. Blow on it by the power of your Holy Spirit, oh God, until this becomes a fire inside of our hearts that we just walk with a spring in our step. We walk with our head held high. We walk with confidence knowing that we are children of royalty, that our bloodline in the natural realm stops and that we are adopted sons and daughters of Almighty God, that we have an inheritance and that we're looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. We're looking for a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And we know who we are in Christ, and we know who Christ is in us. God, stir us to the very foundation of our being, that we would look at prayer in a whole different manner, that we would look at prayer and our walk with you in a different manner. In Jesus' powerful name we pray. And everyone said amen and amen and amen. Before you leave, I just want to say, if you need prayer this morning, I want you to come forward. I'm going to call for some of the deacons maybe to come forward too, uh, Pastor Brian. But if you need prayer this morning around this altar, you come. We'll anoint you with oil, and we'll be violent towards the promises of God and believe that he will absolutely move in your life and in your heart. Amen.